Welcome to session 17. You guys, we've made it 16 sessions or 16 hours through. We're now two thirds of the way through. So keep fighting fit, keep fighting strong. And we've got only eight hours to go. And I hope you're doing well and you're enjoying what we're learning today. Now I'm handing you over to Tony Fitzpatrick now. Yes, it is a second Fitz Fitzpatrick. And yes, he is Carl's brother. And both of them are New Zealanders and both of them now live in Europe, surprisingly. But today he's going to talk about intensive care Archicad. So he's going to talk about how, how they're handling Archicad and, and the use in which they do uh, their major uh, health work. Um, and, it's, and, and from my perspective, there's so much that can be learned from the processes from large projects that you can adapt and, and, and reduce down so that you can get major benefits out of this on your smaller project also. So don't turn off if you just go, oh, this is a major project, I'm a single, I'm a sole practitioner, I only do small housing. Trust me, there's always something to learn from our major projects. So now I'd like to hand you over to Tony. Hi, Nathan, and thanks for the introduction. And welcome everyone from Helsinki, Finland. Uh, today, I'm going to share with you uh, our experience on using Archicad in an open VIM environment, uh, focusing on hospital design. So we are AW2 Architects, and we're an international company with offices in Helsinki, Finland, and Tallinn, Estonia. We have uh, approximately 70 staff. Uh, with 50 in our Helsinki office and 20 in our Tallinn office. Uh, we focus primarily on healthcare design, um, some projects on our own and some projects as part of a larger design consortium which we call Integrated Healthcare and we work with uh, other companies based throughout Finland and Europe. About myself, um, I'm Tony Fitzpatrick and I currently work as an architect and head of BIM at AW2 Architects in Helsinki, Finland. Um, I'm also co-founder and CEO of another company called The BIM Crowd, which we set up in 2019. And this is an architectural outsourcing and BIM consultancy, primarily focusing on the New Zealand market at present and hoping to one day expand our services worldwide. Uh, prior to coming to Finland, I lived in New Zealand, well, I'm from New Zealand. Uh, I spent 20 odd years there as an architectural designer, um, working primarily in residential projects and a number of small commercial projects ranging from, you know, cafes and restaurants up to the old rest home and even a small sports stadium. And I've been up in Finland since mid-2015. Um, I came up here to be a part of a competition team working on a hospital project which is the sort of the focus of this presentation. I've been using Archicad since 1999 and am the Archicad guru in our company up here in Finland. Um, so yeah, always having to answer lots of odd questions about Archicad. And I am also a Graphisoft certified Archicad BIM manager. So a little bit about our, our company. Um, so as the BIM manager, I like to get into the data side of things. So have over the years been experimenting with Power BI and how we can use that um, as a BIM tool and also as a tool for demonstrating our office capabilities, basically. Um, so there's a range of charts there uh, just showing where we've worked. Um, with the top left there being a map showing the spread of our projects, the big blue dot obviously being Finland uh, with the majority of our workers and then the green dot being Estonia um, and then a couple of or a few projects in France, 
Middle East and Vietnam. Our top 10 projects there in the middle, um, both by floor area and by value. Um, by floor area, our biggest project uh, is Luxon Ute Sairala, which is the Luxo Hospital in um, Helsinki, Finland, with 700 million euro budget. And then the Tartu 3, which was a um, extension to Tartu Hospital in Tartu, Estonia. And Kantahamin Keskusarala, which is the central hospital of a little region called Kantahamin in Finland. Um, and then a hospital in Tallinn. And then the next one down, the orange one, being Silta Sairala uh, Cancer and or Cancer Centre in Helsinki, Finland, which is the project I come to Finland for at 260 million euros. The spread of our work by country down the bottom right there, um, Finland obviously making up the biggest proportion of our work base. Estonia being next and then a spread of smaller countries including Vietnam down there. And sort of a similar chart but just focusing on our work in Finland. Uh, the map there showing how much uh, floor area we've designed by city. Um, the big red dot being the uh, Helsinki metropolitan area and then a spread of green dots um, throughout various parts of Finland. Probably the big green dot you can see in the middle there being Uvascula uh, Finland, which is home of Finland's favorite architect, Alvar Aalto. And at the top there, heading up to Rovaniemi, almost at the Arctic Circle. Um, so we've got a, a fair spread of work through Finland. On the top right there is a spread of the, the type of work we do um, based on gross floor area. Sairala's hospitals being 69% of our um, output and Toimisto being office spaces next at uh, around 11% and then schools being at 11% as well and then the one at five percent being sort of public type buildings, um, museums, uh, libraries, those sorts of places where public go. Um, and then we've got some charts here just showing which cities we do most of our work in. So in the uh, second in from the bottom left, uh, Helsinki obviously being our largest market uh, and then Hamanlina, which is not far from Helsinki, and then Espo, which is basically a part of Greater Helsinki City in the metropolitan area. And then on the bottom left there is a sort of a spread of our work over the years, um, obviously showing an increase in the proportion of hospital work as we approached 2018 and unfortunately I haven't had a chance to update that chart yet but there would be even more there now so the uh, main focus of my presentation today is as I said uh, our use of open BIM in hospital design uh, we'll focus mainly on this project being the Silta Sairala hospital the bridge hospital in Helsinki, Finland. Uh, this is a project which I came to Finland to join the competition team uh, back in 2015 alongside my younger brother Carl who presented um, a couple of sessions before me today. The project was for a client called Hus Real Estate. Um, I can't really even say that Finnish word. Um, so this is the Hus is the Helsinki Usuma Hospital District, which is the largest hospital district in 
Finland. Um, and they have a real estate company that manages all of the, the property. So that's the, the primary client. The planning dates or the uh, planning range started in 2015 and we're looking for completion sometime 2022, so next year. And this was a project of approximately 70,000 square meters. Uh, for this one, we formed the Integrated Healthcare uh, Consortium, which consisted of ourselves, Harris Kissick Architects in Helsinki, BM Architects also in Helsinki, and Bruno Saunier Architecture out of Paris, France. So we actually won this project, um, and which was for a uh, trauma and cancer centre as an extension to the existing hospital campus here in Helsinki. And it involved sort of the full range of um, hospital uh, operations. So everything from um, operating theatres through radiotherapy, um, emergency room, outpatient places, uh, cancer treatment areas and a four-storey inpatient ward. So here's a few renderings just of the of the building. Um, external view there, and the name Bridge Hospital sort of ar arrives from the fact that in the sort of bottom left there, you can see a little glass bridge uh, linking the two. Two different parts of the of the hospital, and here's the internal uh, foyer entry area of the hospital, um, looking up through the I think that's the inpatient wards, four stories above the the ground there. So the team for this project, um, obviously a client again being Hus Real Estate, um, and then us on the left there forming Team Integrated, so that's the four founding partners of Team Integrated, and then our other consultants being in the top top right there, Engineering Design, so a Insinorit from, I think they're pretty, Estonian, uh, Grönland, and Rambol, so they took care of the various uh, engineering and mechanical features. And SRV Construction from Finland, who were the um, contractors in charge of building this project. So some key metrics on this project. Um, it was approximately 303 million euro budget to build. Its final floor area was 71,500 square meters. It's 311 meters in length, and it consisted of, uh, up until construction, 194 different IFC models. There were 81,000. Ah, sorry, 8,100 precast concrete elements and over 4 million kilograms of steel used to construct. So our workflow, as I said, we uh, used OpenBIM for this one. Um, this was, while our company has been in operation for a number of years, this was probably our first uh, major collaboration effort uh, on this scale. Uh, we've been using ArchiCAD again for many years, um, and this was also the first real uh, big project where we pushed ArchiCAD to the limits. Um, we were by no means perfect in what we've done in this project. Uh, it was a real um, 
work it as we go type project um, with a lot of new developments in Archicad uh, along the way. I think we started out in about version 18 and then have incorporated uh, lots of the new features as Archicad has um, evolved over the last few years. So during the competition phase we used Archicad as our primary modeling tool um, and we were just working on um, PLNs, no real teamwork functionality at that stage so it was lots of just um, various folders and copy pasting stuff into a main folder or a main file as it was needed. Uh, we used Celebrity just as a way of checking the model quickly in 3D and for our visualization purposes we used uh, render lights cinema 4d and photoshop and we had a pretty good rendering team on this one which obviously i think helped in um, winning the competition as well um, the team the guys actually part of this this project the rendering team uh, they've gone on and won a number of projects over the years since this and do some pretty good stuff during the realization phase, we again used ArchiCAD as our primary CAD BIM tool. At this point, BIM Cloud uh, came along in its current form, so we jumped on board with BIM Cloud uh, reasonably early in the process, as we saw this was probably the only way that we were going to coordinate the four offices um, throughout. Helsinki in France. Again, Celebrity was used um, for checking the you know the model integrity. Uh, also, clash detection, uh, running automatic rule sets as well along the way to check things like uh, fire escape routes, uh, things like that. Although we've used Celebrity mainly. Uh, in a um, manual format without too much of the automatic stuff for the clash detection as we find that the automated clash detection rule sets on a project of this size uh, create uh, horrendous amounts of data that has to be go through so we tend to use do like manual checking for clashes and the stuff that really interests us um, again, we've used render lights for our realization drawings or our um, visualization drawings, and then we have been using the cave, um, so the 3D virtual reality environment for um, presenting pro presenting the project to client. Um, we had a big room process for this project where. Uh, all the consultants were meeting regularly on site. Um, there was a cave purchased by the client um, and installed in the big room location. So these daily, weekly meetings would always involve some aspect of uh, cave presentation. So they would have all the user groups were generally represented um, in the in the big room and they would have their turn in the cave to uh, check out their part of the hospital um, and see how it worked for them so it was lots of um, fine tuning done via the cave and also there was use of Revit, MagicCAD and AutoCAD by some of our consultants and so these were all brought back to our federated celebrity model by way of IFCs. And then during the construction phase, uh, we've been using Tecla structures and Tecla model sharing and Dalex viewer for looking at stuff on site. So that's been mainly driven by the, the contracting side. So how we engage with our stakeholders during this project, um, obviously at the start we got the client requirements, 
all the, the room cards for the project. Um, we used Model Space, I think was the uh, software we used for coordinating that with the Archicad model. So then we have used our, our BIM model, um, which was broken up into a number of smaller modules. Uh, we, I can't remember the exact number of modules, but we had like, uh, for the main hospital, hot hospital area, um, we would have like a, a model for each of the floors of the cancer clinic and the trauma clinic. And then we had another model uh, which consisted of the four floor, four stories of the inpatient ward area. So we had separate teams working on each of these models and then we were bringing them together in a larger main model which we're also bringing in things like the furnishing and the fixtures and equipment. And also in this model we were bringing in uh, some of the subconsultants IFC, so especially the uh, HVAC type stuff and um, sprinklers and those sorts of IFCs so we could then be producing our room elevations with all of the equipment in, in place from our Archicad model. So then we were using this uh, federated Archicad model to produce our 2D outputs, uh, all their drawings. We were also all our schedules that we needed of furniture and fittings and windows and doors, everything else we needed, and also using BIMX as a tool for quickly jumping around the building when needed um, with clients and stuff like that. And also to get to the cave, we were then post-processing in render lights and then putting that into the cave where we would then, as we said earlier, get the stakeholders in and the user groups and they would analyze and check through the um, various rooms and parts of the hospital and give us their feedback which we would then put back into the process and refine as necessary and repeat until we got it sorted. So the cave, if you're unaware of what the cave is, is the cave automatic virtual environment. So you put on some fancy little 3D glasses and it projects the image onto um, three walls and the floor through uh, four projectors. So this is this enables us to produce a full-scale, lifelike um, environment in which the user can get a real feel for the hospital. So they were doing things like uh, going into patient rooms and um, walking around beds, finding out where drawers and cupboards and things like that should be where plugs felt the most comfortable and accessible and and then we were refining our design to get all that uh, intricate feedback incorporated into the final design rather than finding out later on that you know there were issues on site and after the design phase, the clients have continued to use this cave as a virtual training environment. So they are bringing staff in who are going to be working in this new wing and making them aware of the environment. So um, staff are going to be able to hit the ground running so that if anything happens, um, emergency or whatever, early on, they're not going to get lost in this new hospital already have been there. So um, with the feedback from our client on this one, so they thought that the big room was an excellent system. Um, so they, they really enjoyed working with the architects on a day-to-day -day basis and felt that their um, feedback was valued and incorporated into the into the process. 
and they have really loved the cave environment. So as I said, some groups are still using it for training. Oops. And this project, um, we entered into the Tekla Global BIM Awards and also the Nordic BIM Award, the Tekla Nordic BIM Awards, and we won Best Public Project overall in the Tekla Global BIM Awards and also got a highly commended in the Nordic BIM Awards for 2020. So as I said, this project was our first real um, big BIM collaboration project. It's sort of since then we have entered a stage of really analyzing how we're working and what works, what doesn't, and where we should be heading. And really starting to put a focus on doing BIM properly for a start and well. So we have our AW2 information management system, which is uh, consists of two pillars, one being the systems and the other being the processes that we use to work those systems. So our systems consist of obviously our hardware and the software that we run on it. Uh, very important that the hardware is capable of functioning with the software nowadays. Um, we've found that you know some staff do have problems at times with their laptops which might be underpowered for particular projects or software. So that causes all sorts of issues which we are sort of trying to address. Um, there's the standards that we have to work to and up in Finland here it's really great that we have um, the system called Tullo 2000 which is the Finnish standard for information management. Um, it's been around since the 80s I understand um, and they've, it's probably one of the forerunners on you know, BIM standards worldwide. So what Tullo 2000 does is it classifies every component of the building process into a, a number. And so that allows you then to manage that data um, consistently across a project, um, knowing exactly where things are going. So if it's an external wall, you'll put it on the um, classification so it grows across layers as well for um, the external wall, uh, which might be one, sorry, I can't remember off the top of my head, what, one, three, three, one, or something like that. So um, it makes data management across all uh, consult consultants very easy and um, compatible. And then there's the systems that we use for output of our data. Um, we still do a lot of PDF output, we haven't quite um, evolved to the full uh, BIM environment yet. We're also doing a lot of DVG exporting and importing um, between consultants. Some of them are still working on those systems which you know, are only 2D. And also there's a lot of coordination using IFC models. So a lot of the consultants um, are able to provide us with IFC models and likewise us providing them with IFC models. So we can be all uh, bringing these together in a um, federated model and seeing how everything fits together. And then there's the, obviously the people we're working with, um, the type of design we're working on, how we deal with change management, so collaboration and training. Um, with collaboration wise, we're starting to introduce um, BIM Collab so that we can collaborate both internally and externally on issues within a project. Um, I have led the introduction of this in another hospital project we're working on and found this to be an excellent means of uh, managing the whole uh, issue 
process. So if there's anything that we notice um, that's wrong, is not working, we can quickly send um, issues directly out of Archicad or Celebrity to the consultant um, in question and they'll get it and they can go to the same place in their model and deal with it um, quite easily. And training is another big one. We've found that um, as we've grown as a company, we were 15 to 20 people when I started back in 2015 up to the 70 we are now. And training has been a critical component of that. We've done a lot of basic Archicad training over the years to bring everyone up to um, better levels than where they were at. Um, we're also now looking at a whole um, new system, the management system and processes, which is going to involve uh, even bigger um, commitment to training over the years ahead. And then there's our processes, so how we coordinate um, both internally and externally, how we manage our quality, so we're introducing um, a lot of auditing procedures, we're using Celebrity to check for issues with the, our own Archicad model as well as with um, clashes with external consultants. We're also looking at how we're using, or how we are um, getting the end users involved in the design process, so things like the cave. And then another area we're exploring and working on is dashboards for management of both projects and our office as a whole. Um, Power BI is one of those tools that we're looking at there and have been using to generate this sort of data and really believe that there's a huge, huge opportunity for using a tool like Power BI for um, displaying information from our models. So our general workflow, um, obviously start off by ascertaining the project brief. And then once we get moving uh, onto the project, we have a or come up with a BIM plan. So we start and uh, work out what our BIM execution plan is or our project execution plan as we tend to call it more. This covers such things as how we're going to structure the model. So um, whether we, at the early stages, we want to try and identify what issues could arise uh, during the design process. So, and how big the project will be, so how we need to um, structure the project so that we can manage the manage it in a um, less problematic uh, format. We found that sometimes when you try and throw everything into one model, uh, it causes all sorts of problems. So we break it down into sort of functional areas. And then we also, at that stage, um, try and identify what our data requirements are for that project. So whether it's a full-on BIM project or whether there's just a small need for BIM data. And also what other data we can extract from the model that will help us in the design process. So some of that information also comes from the client, so it's, it's directed by their needs as well. And then we're into the concept modeling stage. So we tend to use Archicad primarily as our um, modeling tool of choice. Uh, sometimes we use a bit of uh, SketchUp as well for just basic mass massing and, and those sorts of studies. Um, we also are in the process of bringing in Dorofus as a data management tool which would then inform our early concept modeling directly into Archicad and we're also looking to try and incorporate more Grasshopper Rhino type functionality and algorithmic parametric design to allow us to investigate lots of options early on. And then once we've got the concept model um, done we move on to the design model stage and again we use Archicad as our um, primary modeling tool through the BIM cloud um, and then from Archicad 
we are exporting information into various other um, packages. So we use BIM Colab, as I said, for our data management, uh, sorry, issue management processes. So that has a nice direct link um, to BIM Colab and ArchiCAD. We also export IFCs to Celebrity where we um, do our clash detection and all that sort of stuff with our external consultants IFC models as well. We try and use Excel wherever possible um, out of ArchiCAD for trying to manage um, things like uh, just putting data into objects and elements rather than trying to do it in ArchiCAD which we find very time consuming and then using some of that data exporting it into Power BI so we can produce nice dashboards and presentations for clients and internal purposes showing various aspects of the project and then obviously out into render lights in the cave which we then present to our client as well for their feedback. So one of the areas which has really um, interested me over the last few years is actually using the data we generate from our BIM model. Um, there's various platforms that we can use for that, Power BI, Tableau, Looker, a, a number, um, and there's obviously many, many more. My total choice so far has been Power BI. So what do we do with the data? So we've got, obviously, up in the top there is like a whole pile of Lego bricks which sort of equates to just being raw data. It's fine, you've got lots of stuff there but with it, what can you do with it? So we can then go down and we can start sorting that data into piles and, and arranging it say by colours or shapes or sizes. Which is fine, we can clearly see you know different piles of data there and, and how it relates to each other. But then when it really gets interesting is when we start arranging that data and then finding ways to present it visually. And it's not until we start presenting that data visually that it really starts to then resonate with um, our clients and, and people in general who don't tend to be able to draw too much from just raw data. They like to be able to see it presented in a way that's understandable and that they can see patterns and trends and stuff. And one thing I've noticed over this time is I have a young daughter myself um, who was born in the last couple of years and has grown up while I've been doing this data stuff and playing with her I've noticed that you know it's actually an um, inherent human need to classify data right from the earliest age kids are starting to pick things up and put them in piles depending on shapes or colours or sizes and things like that so I don't think that changes through our life. So as an example, um, in ArchiCAD, here's the raw data. We've just spat out some schedules with, you know, stories, zones, their sizes, um, materials and stuff like that associated with that zone in ArchiCAD. By sorting it, we've then started to sort it by, say, floor in this level. So we've got all the um, zones organized by floor. But where it can be really useful and is to then take that data and do something with it. So from those tables before we couldn't really see much but now I've used Power BI to take data out of ArchiCAD and present um, these sort of charts for our clients. So this is based on another hospital that I've been working on um, and I've been able to like create things like show where the area of the hospital is um, taken up. So in the top right there, top left, sorry, we can see that Kaltavat, which is um, hallways and waiting areas, corridors and waiting areas, is by far the biggest user of space in this hospital. And then we head down to the various other areas. We've also used it to link up to a, another table with basic costings, so we took um, the areas of different types of hospital space and multiplied it by a approximate cost per square metre based on the type of um, area it is and gave us a estimated project budget which we could be working through as we develop the hospital design. Um, and then we've 
done other things along the way like um, workloads so we've started using Archicad to analyze uh, workloads for projects so we've created a property and assigned that property with um, usernames so that if you're working on an area of a hospital you claim that as yours and then we've got a measuring um, property in that um, zone or that category property to tell us how far advanced that design of the area is and then we've created a dashboard so that we can then start measuring progress of um, the design as we go is that we found that while we were doing it the old way we never really had any idea of where we were at design wise so if someone wanted to know at what stage we were at it was always a guess as to how far evolved the design was so we've also used that to then create this dashboards showing just who is, um, no sorry, what parts of the hospital are most advanced or what stage they're at. Um, so whether it's by story or by locker, which is part. And then we got an overall project barometer um, to show all of the data um, together. And then down there I've also had a targeted um, chart to show that how far away how far away each part of the hospital is from target to be com considered complete so yeah thank you very much i hope you um picked up something for today oh no sorry that's not the one um so what can we do with the data generated from these bin models um we can report to the client on how the project is made up so areas important ratios preliminary costings we can manage the project internally and across all of our consultants. This also Power BI was linking to um, BIM Colab so that we could manage our issues and how they were um, being dealt with. And we can do sort of building analysis, so occupancy loads, peak usage, uh, probably energy usage, um, things like that. So thank you for taking the time to listen to me today and I'll now throw you back to Nathan and any questions, um, I'm here to answer those. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that great presentation, Tony. And, and, for, and there might be some people out there taking wages to find out uh, which uh, session I will fall asleep on. Um, proud to say I haven't fallen asleep on this one. So uh, we made it through, mate. Well done. Now, Cheers. Now, You're doing well yourself. Oh, well, we're getting there. We've been, we've been sitting here for quite a few hours now, and I'm hoping that people are really <laughs> enjoying the content and making it worthwhile. We can see that, you know, we're sitting at about 98 people sitting with us live right now out of the out of the 1,700 registrations. So it's been a good turnout for considering it's a virtual event. Um, with all these sorts of things. So we've got Bjorn. He wants to know if that is where the Santa lives near, near you. Uh, <laughs> up near Rovanami, that little dot yeah. at the top of the map I showed early on. <laughs> yeah, so is that where Santa comes from? Is yeah. That where, is that where I send him my, my wish list for um, graphics? It is, yeah, that's Santa. The Santa, Santa Claus Village is up there, yes. <laughs> we've got a query from Graham uh, regarding the cave environment and what's the alt optimum size for a cave? Oh, um, that's a bit technical from beyond me, but um, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to think the one that we've got seems to be about three or four metres you know, square and a couple of metres high, so, and it seems to do the job, but I'm not sure of the best configuration, sorry. Well, it'd have to do with the number of people that were to interact or the type of spaces that they're going to interact, I'm assuming, so it kind of could relate back to that a bit more, I guess. Would that be the case? Probably would, and also the, the bigger you would, I'm guessing more cameras and stuff would be required, and it would all come down to the projection angles, I think, of the cameras and, and how you've got them positioned. So, yeah. yeah, no, there was this, this school uh, based on the Gold Coast here in Australia that um, spent a million dollars, not on a cave per se, but a 360-degree room. So it had six projectors all keyed and lined, to, lined up with one another to produce this 360 degree cylinder projection so it was a full immersive envir environment for learning so it's not only caves that can be useful for that sort of stuff but I, it, it, people get all excited with that yeah. <laughs> uh, a, a question from David uh, 
It is always a challenge facing the complexity of health buildings. Um, I'd like to ask you regarding the use of IFC outcomes in particular. Could you tell us a bit um, which was the use? So basically how we're using IFC schema properties. Uh, we're using the standard presets based upon um, a model view definition or were you using your own custom property sets? Uh, I think there's probably um, a mixture of both. So the, primarily the standard preset configuration and then for some particular aspects we were adding our own own setups for especially things like um, like coding of door furniture and stuff like that we were big names and cutting them down into short names and stuff to be able to to use in different places yeah so so basically it wasn't you were using it for data as well not just for geometry uh, yeah 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 Yep. So, a question from Sam. Um, you're collaborating a lot with other architecture firms. Um, how have your processes developed over this time? So, when you're working with other architecture firms, um, yep. you, you've obviously learned as you've gone, and then the other practices obviously have their views on how they, they view the world. I'm assuming that's what Sam's question is in regarding to the processes and, and the different practices. How, how have you evolved and I guess how have those pr practices changed you or you changed them? Yeah, um, basically over the level since this project, so the pr last four or five years especially, we've been really starting to focus on how we work um, and what's the best way to work together. ArchiCAD's obviously evolved quite a lot in that time too from what, version 18 or whatever we started on to, to 24 now. Um, so we are looking to introduce more uh, like a, a real BIM structure. So we're starting to bring in rules and um, systems and processes, whereas up, up until sort of now, it's been a wee bit of a free for all. Um, and even some of the projects still going on, there is this, you know, four or five officers collaborating, but with no no one really in charge. Um, so our, our approach now is that, you know, there's gonna be someone in charge and we're looking to try and take that role as, as, as much as possible, but it's without someone being in charge, it's a, it's a nightmare. <laughs> oh, no one ever wants to be in charge either. <laughs> they always, <No. laughs> they always wanna pass the buck and say, no, it's someone else's issue to deal with. Um, yeah, yeah. Matt's has asked a really good, important question. So have you collaborated with another architectural firm using Revit? Uh, and if you have, um, how did you divide? How did you divide the project up? You know, vertical silos, um, one part doing it, all the healthcare department. So, how, first of all, did you have you done that? If you have, how have you? Uh, I haven't experienced that myself. I've got a, I've got a feeling that we do have a project in the office where that may be the case, but um, I'm sort of not involved in that one, so I'm not really sure how that's gone on. Yeah, well, Matt's, uh, Brennan Reid, who presented first today when he was working with Rice Dorben, he worked um, on a $2 billion hospital here uh, in Australia. And yep. um, they worked with Architectus, and Architectus were a Revit based practice. So uh, Rice Dorbney, who are now HDR, who now use Revit, don't even go into that story. Um, but they HDR or Rice Dorbney did the whole internal of the hospital and Architectus did the, the actual shell, the external shell of the right. building in, in, in Revit. So there's a lot of IFC issues and they uncovered a lot of um, missing components out of Archicad with base quantities not going out of certain, using certain tools. Mind you, that yep. is, you know, almost a, eight years ago, probably now. So that's how they broke it up on a, on a major hospital project. Yep. Um, Sam wants to know how you manage the IFC coordination process with external consultants. So uh, you did talk about in your presentation about a lot of 2D work going on. Um, how did yep. you, how did, did, were all the consultants actually still in the end providing models? Uh, on the projects that I've been involved with, most of them have been uh, model based, uh, IFC based. There's been a few, it's probably sort of smaller consultants who are still providing us just DVGs, but um, that whole coordination system, we base it on a um, common origin point, uh, which is defined at the start of the project uh, in relation to sort of a set datum in either Finland or Helsinki or whatever, or whatever the client's preferred um, origin point is, and then everyone just works to that. Um, 
And if someone provides us with a IFC that it hasn't got the origin point in, we sort of send it back and say, hey, can you, you know, uh, locate this properly and then we can bring it into our model. Now, with that, and one of the things that I've often said, there's no point in doing 3D model coordination if there's one stakeholder that's missing because that's inevitably where you're going to get the clash. Um, yeah. The people that weren't operating in a 3D environment, were what was their scope of services or design near mission critical at all or was it kind of minor works that didn't actually matter if they you know if they did have a clash those sort of things from memory have been more just minor minor stuff so like all the the major consultants like your hvacs and um fire uh we call it sprinkler systems and uh engineering structural engineering have all been iocs and it might be just someone who's doing a i don't know a little part then they just quite often just give us a dvg and we go from there and then you end up modeling it which is the same process yeah, yeah, we yeah. all do <laughs> when we have uh, engineers that don't model and we want to model it ourselves just to see so we end up taking the fall for it just because we want to make sure it all coordinates um we've got yeah, a yeah. question from sam regarding how room data was managed um first of all i just want to ask you about that and then um after how that's managed how was it updated after you had meetings with your clients in the cave um those were done, I'm trying to think, that, that project was done using um, model space, I think. And um, so we've got a, a sort of a mix of systems, of, um, depending on projects, seems to be a lot of it's client driven up here. Um, I'm pushing in our office to try and introduce Dorofus as our standard means of data management for that sort of thing. Um, yeah. And sort of I've got reasonable amount of buy-in from the company to, to head down that line. but. These, these projects have been, I think some of them even started off with just the old uh, Excel spreadsheets and done manually. So that's all been evolving over time. Um, and some of them are even just PDFs. <laughs> oh, no. <nice. laughs> yeah, now Graham talked, I guess, asked whether it had Drophus is being used in the practice. So it's something that you're starting your journey on at the moment. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it's we've sort of, um, we had a, as part of our BIM review process, we reviewed uh, various systems for data management collaboration and with a view to introducing them down the track as we as we evolve and Dorofus came out, you know, favourite there and also BIM Colab as our collaboration partner. So we're yeah. sort of starting on the collaboration side and, and then working towards um, Dorofus. Yeah, no, well, Dorofus, I think, is a pretty, there's, there's, once again, it's almost like Nemechek by high end, you know, the best best in breed software, so, you know, so they've got their yeah. hands on Celebri and, and, and uh, Dorofus, but the one thing I struggle with the Dorofus is their, is their licensing policy, uh, the pricing, and I remember speaking with Ralph, uh, Rolf, um, founder of, of Dorofus, about a decade ago when we were investigating that, when we are doing major aged care projects, and that was probably the one thing that kind of cost, you know, cost us changing over at the time because yeah. we couldn't realise the return on investment at that stage. Um, but it has developed yeah. a lot over the last decade. Yeah, and I think their licensing seems to have changed because the last um, correspondence I had with them was they've sort of got a internal office licence uh, option rather than the, the square metre project. Point. Yeah, so I think it was now there's like a you know X amount of dollars per month and or euros, and that allows you to use it in your office. Um, oh, so it's it's kind it of seemed I, quite reasonable. So it's more reasonable than enterprise, which is the enterprises you know normally for offices that are doing heaps and heaps and heaps of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bjorn's enjoying himself. That's good, mate. I think you'll enjoy the next session more. Um, Sam's got the most uh, important question of the night, mate. Are you Santa? <laughs> <laughs> Sam's closer, I think. <laughs> oh. uh, Tony, mate, thank you very much um, for contributing uh, as part of Arc Intensive 2021 and being one of our 24 sessions to drive us through this 24-hour period. Um, you've, you've gotten me still when I'm awake, so I can still ask good <laughs> questions and sensible questions of you. So, thank you very much for contributing, mate. And uh, and now we'll head to a six-minute break uh, before we move into uh, session 18. Uh, 